How you doing, Sue High Earth Science students? Welcome to part two of our Global Energy Podcast. Now let's talk about the idea of planetary energy balance. In other words, how the Earth distributes the energy it receives from the Sun. So write that in your notes. So planetary energy balance is how the Earth distributes the energy it receives from the Sun. Now. I'd like you to get this diagram in your notes. Um, you don't have to do all the different uh, details in here, but I'd like you to, to take a second and write this in your notes so you have something to study, because it's really important. We're going to go back to this a couple of times. Let's introduce the idea of energy equilibrium. Energy equilibrium. What this means is that the energy given off from the Earth must equal the amount of energy hitting the earth from the sun. Write that down. So equilibrium has the idea of equal in it. So it's the energy given off from the earth must equal the amount of energy hitting the earth from the sun. Now any small differences in this balance will lead to climate change as the earth, as the earth will either be, either be losing heat or storing it. Also get that in your notes. So any small differences in this equilibrium or balance will lead to climate change as the Earth is either, either losing heat or storing it. So how do we know this? First, some background information. The Earth's surface temperature depends on three main things. Let's get those in your notes. The first is the total amount of solar, remember solar is sun, total amount of solar or sun's energy available at the distance of the Earth's orbit. We call that flux, F-L-U-X. Please write that in your notes. So the total amount of solar energy available at the distance of the Earth's orbit, remember the Earth's 93 million miles away, we call that amount of solar energy available Solar flux, F-L-U-X. Write that in your notes. Secondly, is the Earth's reflectivity. It's the word reflective, re reflectivity called albedo, A-L-B-E-D-O. So secondly is the Earth's reflectivity we call albedo. Get that in your notes. Now the albedo, or reflectivity, changes depending on where the sun's rays hit. Let's look at this slide. So the albedo changes depending on what's on the surface of the Earth. So if we look at this slide, on the left-hand side there's no ice or snow, and on the right there is. So a surface, surface without snow or ice absorbs more heat and light. That would be here on the left. So that, this would absorb more heat and light. Write that down. It then makes sense that a surface with more snow and ice reflects that heat and light, which is right here on the right-hand side. Also write that down. So the conclusion is that if the surface reflects heat, it's much cooler. And it, if it absorbs heat, it's much warmer. So also get that down. We call that albedo, the reflectivity. Now the third thing that can affect the temperature on the planet is the magnitude of the greenhouse effect. Write that down. The magnitude, magnitude is how big or how great the greenhouse effect is. Get that in your notes. First of all, let's propose what if there were no atmosphere at all. Scientists calculate that the average temperature on the Earth's surface with no atmosphere on Earth would be minus 18 degrees Celsius or zero Fahrenheit. Write that down. So with no atmosphere, the Earth's average temperature on the surface would be zero. Obviously, that's much colder than now. 
Right now, our average temperature is 15 degrees Celsius or 35 Fahrenheit on the surface that we measure today. Also get that down. So why the difference? The difference is the greenhouse effect caused by the presence of our atmosphere. So let's briefly look at how this works. First of all, it's important that you understand that it's the Earth's surface that heats up the atmosphere. Write that down. It's the Earth's surface that heats up the atmosphere. How? Well, the sun's radiation is absorbed by the ground and given off as infrared heat. Write that down. So the ground absorbs the sun's radiation and gives it off as infrared heat. Now, as you can see from this diagram, our atmosphere has the effect of keeping this heat from escaping the Earth's surface. Also write that down. So it traps it. So if there were no atmosphere, all that heat would go out into space. But because we have an atmosphere, it traps that heat. Now the gases responsible for this trapping are called greenhouse gases, which makes sense since the atmosphere acts like the glass in a greenhouse and traps the heat. Also get that in your notes. That's how a greenhouse works. Let's the light through but traps the heat that's generated into the greenhouse and raises the temperature. Now a good example of a greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. So when we refer to the magnitude of the greenhouse effect, we're talking about the quantity of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Write that down. So the conclusion we want you to come up with is that the greater the concentration of greenhouse gases, the greater the ability of the atmosphere to hold in heat. Yes, write that down as well. So in other words, the thicker the atmosphere, the more heat it holds in. In today's world, scientists are most concerned about the buildup of these greenhouse gases from human sources like automobiles, factories, and refrigerators. We refer to this phenomenon as global warming. Write that down. So automobiles, factories, and refrigeration are the three most great contributors to the concentration of greenhouse gases and cause what scientists refer to as global warming. So make sure you get that in your notes. Now let's take a brief look at the effect of clouds on the atmospheric radiation budget. First, let's look at some basic cloud types and get them in your notes. Now we'll talk in more detail about cloud types during our weather unit, but this is a really good time to just introduce them. So in this picture, you see what's called cumulus clouds. Cumulus clouds look like individual globs or cloud masses that normally have a flat base. You see a flat base right here on this cloud. So they normally have a flat base and a domed top. So here you see the domed top here on this cumulus cloud. So a flat base, domed top, write that in your notes. Now, also write that cumulus clouds are normally a sign of fair weather. They're normally a sign of fair weather. The second cloud type is cumulonimbus, like you see here. Cumulonimbus clouds are big, tall clouds that normally generate thunderstorms. Write that in your notes. Now their shape is the typical anvil shaped. Okay, They have a flat top, not a flat bottom like cumulus clouds, a flat top and then a big, wide body on the bottom. So this is a cumulonimbus cloud, and these normally generate thunderstorms. So get that in your notes as well. Now the third type are stratus clouds, like you see here. And they are a uniform layer of low clouds that frequently cover much of the sky and sometimes produce light precipitation. 
So these are stratus clouds. Uniform layer, you can see there's really no distinguishing between the cloud types, no globs or anything, just kind of a, a low layer that covers the sky and that produces precipitation. So write that in your notes. Cirrus clouds are detached high clouds composed of ice. Write that in your notes. So you see these wispy clouds here are cirrus clouds and they're composed of basically ice filaments. So make sure you get that in your notes. Now they indicate fair weather as well. So cumulus and cirrus clouds um, indicate fair weather. So make sure you get that down as well. Okay, now that we know the basic cloud types, what does this all mean to the global energy budget, right? Now, clouds keep the days cooler and the nights warmer than if there were no clouds. Write that down. So clouds keep the days cooler and the nights warmer than if they weren't around. Now, you might ask yourself, well, how does that work? Well, all types of clouds reflect incoming radiation from the sun so that in that respect they could cool the days off. So if the sun's rays never reach the surface, they don't get a chance to warm it. Write that down. However, clouds also act as greenhouse agents. So they trap the heat coming from the ground and therefore make the nights cooler. So at night is when that all that heat starts to radiate back off the, the surface, which makes the nights cooler. But if there's clouds, it holds in that heat. So that would make the nights warmer. Write that down. Now, of course, it depends on the cloud types, right? These cirrus clouds would not trap a lot of heat because they're weighing the heck up in the atmosphere and not very thick whereas stratus clouds would trap a lot more heat. So if the cirrus clouds were, were uh, covering the earth at night, that radiation would still have a great chance of um, burning off into the atmosphere, where if it were the stratus clouds, it would certainly keep the nights warmer. So make sure you write those down in your notes. But wait, that can't be the whole story, right? If temperatures were to go up, we would have less snow and ice cover, right? Because they'd melt. This would then make the Earth darker and thus less reflective. This, in turn, would lead to even greater absorption of the sun's energy and radiation and, yep, further heat things up. Get that in your notes. Now what you should be able to see is what's called a feedback loop. Also write that in your notes, a feedback loop, and then we'll explain it. What we mean by a feedback loop is that when the global temperature starts to rise, think about it, when the Earth's temperature starts to rise, the Earth responds to that rise in temperature by taking steps to become cooler. And when it starts to become cooler, it has definite ways of increasing the global temperature. That's called a feedback loop. Write that down. Of course, this assumes that the Earth is left alone to do this on its own. The question is, what effect are humans having on this mechanism? We will most definitely talk in more detail about that later on in this class. But for now, let's just look at these 10 indicators of global warming all right and get those in your notes so i'd like you to get these 10 indicators of a warm and warming world in your notes so that we can talk about them at a later date okay that's it for part two go ahead and submit your notes to moodle and grab that part two study guide and answer the questions in the part two study guide talk to you soon